Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. This is Thailand Ogoy on Rise and Thrive, Indigenous Art, Culture, and Joyful Acts of Resistance on Usula Media. Today, I am here with Loren Spears, who is Narragansett. Loren is the Executive Director of Tomaquag Museum and has been an educator for 25 years. She has served as an adjunct faculty at Brown University and at University of Rhode Island. Loren shares cultural knowledge and traditional arts learned through her family with the public through museum programs. She has written curriculum, poetry, and narratives published in a variety of publications. She works tirelessly to empower Native youth and to educate the public on Native history, culture, the environment, and the arts. Loren was appointed by Governor Gina Raimondo to serve on the board of the Rhode Island State Council of the Arts and the Rhode Island Historical Records Advisory Board. She serves on many other boards, including the Pell Center's Story in the Public Square and South County Tourism Council. Under Spears' leadership, Tomaquag Museum received the Institute of Museum and Library Services National Medal. Spears has also received numerous awards, including a Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa from the University of Rhode Island 2017, the Extraordinary Woman Award 2010, International Day 2010, the Urban League Woman of Substance Award 2006, and the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities 2016 Tom Roberts Prize for creative achievement in the humanities. Loren, thank you for being here. Thank you, Thailand. It's my pleasure. It's so nice to see you. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, we're busy as lunatics. <laughs> as you know, since we honored you this week, we are so thankful for that. And you won the uh, Eleanor Dove uh, Entrepreneur Award, which is so wonderful. So we've had a very busy week. We're on our last day. Today, we're celebrating Matika Wilbur mm -hmm. with the Ellison Tarzan Brown Champion Award for her work on Project 562, um, representing Indigenous people across the nation in photography and the All My Relations uh, podcast yes. and her educational work. So it'll be a wonderful night at six o'clock tonight. Um, which launches right from our uh, website on our honoring pages or on YouTube directly, especially if you want to be chatting along. <laughs> right. That's so fun that you had the chat option. I've been following along because you had one honoree every night this week, and it's been so um, such an incredible pivot for you because usually this honoring is you have it at a country club and it's it's a nice dinner and more interactive, but it's been really wonderful to be able to, to watch live or catch up in the archives and see, uh, I guess really jump in and do kind of a deep dive into each person's experience and their background and um, hear, hear them accept the award. So I really, I really have been enjoying it. Thank How you. How you felt Thank with you. it? It really was different that way. And, you know, we've had some conversation on the backside that even when we go back to the dinner, maybe we should do abbreviated oh. um, video vignettes of, of their life because it really was wonderful interviewing everyone. Um, you know, we had our standard COVID-19 glitches on what we were doing and how we were doing it. And, uh, but all in all, it worked itself out and it was really great to hear the in-depth stories of their lives yes. where normally, you know, we saw a bio in the program book. We had a couple sound bites of what they did but it was really nice to get them to know them personally and hear about their childhood and just sort of their evolution as they lived their lives that got them to the point that they're at, that they're receiving this award. So mm -hmm. it was really a lot of fun to, to get to know people. And, you know, as weird as it is, this virus has created these blessings of, of, capturing this virtual um, experience for people that has been so wonderful in, um, in the work that we do in general uh, to have things captured in a different way um, for m masses to watch. Like mm -hmm. right now, the last look I had, we were close to 600 
you know, views, if you will. In a normal year, we have, on a big year, we have 300 people at that event. And so to have already, and it will have this life after the week right. is up, that people will still be able to see it via our YouTube page, which is just phenomenal. And these stories that are so uplifting about the impact of indigenous communities, which, mm -hmm. you know, we're all about trying to empower that voice um, that in some ways through the conquest and colonization was silenced. It was still there, but it was hidden and not as pervasively out there. So the work um, that you do and the work that we do and the work that the, our honorees do mm -hmm. Um, they're they're creating that voice and that visibility and and the access for people to understand yes. who we are as indigenous people today, what our cultures and communities are like, and what um, contributions we give to the world, not just to the United States, but to the world at large. Um, I think that's really impactful and powerful. Yeah, it's and and just to to know that you will have this impact with these films globally. And like you said, just really share what each person is doing and what con contemporary Native people are doing today. And that, you know, so it's, it's really, I think it's great. And I love the idea of doing going forward when you do, we do get to meet again, short films that can be posted on your YouTube and continue that tradition. So tell me about, I would love if you would share with our audience, <laughs> my Brooklyn just came out, <laughs> my audience, um, <laughs> uh, about the Tomaquag Museum and its beginnings, because it's such a beautiful and unique story. Yes, it's, you know, I'll tell you the abridged version, okay. but <laughs> otherwise we'll be the whole hour just telling that. But uh, Princess Red Wing um, worked with a woman named Eva Butler. So Princess Red Wing was Narragansett Wampanoag. She was a sageman, a leader, an author, and an educator, and just an, an amazing woman born in 1896, I believe. And the amount of impact that she had in her life was just tremendous. But she worked with Eva Butler, who was an anthropologist, and our museum, which is called Tomaquag Museum today, um, was founded in a place called Tomaquag Valley, which is a, a, a village inside the um, town of Hopkinton. And um, that's, it means beavers in the Narragansett language. A lot of times people think that um, it's the name of a tribe when it's not. Um, but we're here located in Rhode Island and Princess Red Wing was um, Narragansett and she served on Narragansett Tribal Council and um, it, as well as being Wampanoag. And in our history, almost every Actually, every executive director has been Narragansett. I don't. I think that's just been by default because we're in in our territory in our homeland. Um, but our museum um, really was inspired by Red Wing's leadership, and it was unique in its time because it was founded in 1958 to have a first person voice, meaning an indigenous person mm -hmm. telling the history of their own people um, to the public and and to their own to community. And that has been something that's been instrumental. And for many years, it was an it was a undocumented norm of our our organization. And since I've been the executive director since 2003, we've made all those unwritten things written things um, in our rules and bylaws to ensure that forever we have that first person voice. So, for example, our board um, by bylaws and since it's been a, a 501c3, had to be a majority native. Um, our staff, the executive director, and all frontline education staff has to be indigenous. Now there's other opportunities for other people in other spaces within our museum that do not have to be indigenous, but those are really important spaces to, to have that face of the indigenous community. And so um, Tomaquag Museum moved to this area in Arcadia, Rhode Island, or the town of Exeter, um, in 1969, after Eva Butler passed away, my grandparents, as you know, owned and operated Dovecrest Indian Restaurant here on this location. And uh, Princess Red Wing went to my grandparents and said, was there a place for the museum? And so they found a place on their property um, where the museum was for the next like seven or eight years. Then when we got our 501c3, we moved next door in an old mm -hmm. farmhouse because you couldn't be on this for-profit property as a nonprofit. And then in, uh, my grandmother sold the restaurant in 1984, all sadness, tears. Uh, <laughs> 
But my mother bought the property back in 96. That was incredible. incredible. Which was incredible Mm -hmm. when um, the other people were not able to make a good success of the restaurant. Um, It came up on the market. And um, it's great to be here in this space. And so now the museum is in the old Dovecrest property. And um, there's lots of history here. There's a mural on the wall where Princess Red Wing and uh, Julian Freeman had painted it back. Um, from what I understand, it was back in like 1960 that they painted this mural on the wall um, that was actually done by a Kiowa uh, indigenous person. And I can't remember the artist's name off the top of my head, but they got it on the back of one of those National Geographic like magazines. And, and they made it into this giant mural on the wall and it shows this plains imagery. It's a beautiful painting by the local people as well as the original mm-hmm. artist. Um, but you know, it, it's um, been really amazing to tell the stories and to watch Tomaquag Museum transition from a very grassroots uh, volunteer run organization. Um, and in the last like say 10 years, we've been kind of 10 to, you know, 15 years, we've been making that slow transition to um, a staffed organization to try to really build in the sustainability, even though we've existed for a long time, we didn't have a lot of business infrastructure. And that's something that we've worked on really a lot in the last several years to um, build our capacity and our staff. And what I love is new people, new ideas that create such a Mm -hmm. vibrancy. So um, I'll tell you one that, uh, Well, I'll tell you a couple things like Silver Moon LaRose, our assistant director, Mm -hmm. who's Narragansett, she's um, leading a sci-fi book club. Um, Every Tuesday night, all fall long, um, people can sign on, it's free. Um, They're getting ready. I think they're in the last week of the third book, but they're going to be starting The Future Home of a Living God by uh, Louise Erdrich. And so all of the books have been... um, uh, sci-fi books, but they, they have, some of them had that like post-apocalyptic feel, which is really in the, the genre these days. Um, but what's really, really cool is these are all native authors. And we try to remind people that native authors like sci-fi too. Native right. people like sci-fi too. Right. So we don't, we're not always knee deep in the history of 400 or 500 years ago and yes. all the trauma that's taken place, which of course we talk about and write about and deal with, but we also do these fun things. Another really fun thing is uh, Lindsay, Silver Moon did it all summer, um, but now Lindsay Montanari, who's Narragansett and one of our educators, she is doing a really fun animated children's hour. It is so phenomenal. It is fabulous. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Anyone that wants to check it out, they can go to our YouTube page. It is so fun. It's fun for kids of all ages. It's really targeting, though, young children in its format. But because the content is content people don't know, it can work for anyone. Uh Uh-oh, there's a text. We're having a technical issue. We'll just keep going, though. (laughs) Push through. (laughs) It's the pandemic way. (laughs) So um, what I love about it is Lindsay is an artist herself and an educator, and she's a senior in in, uh, college. She's finishing up this last semester. She'll have her bachelor's degree. And she had worked here first as a student intern um, volunteer. Then um, later she came back after a couple of years out at Haskell Indian Nations University and she came back and became an educator. And then she went off to finish school, which we're always pushing for through Mm -hmm. our Indigenous Empowerment Network. We're constantly trying to create opportunity and access for education, for job training, for entrepreneurship, for the arts and culture, um, the the teaching of our own community, but also sharing knowledge with the general public. And it, it's so powerful to watch these young people go back to school. Our IEN coordinator, she left to go back to school and like, we're sad to have them gone when they take a, a leave, so to speak. But we know when they come back, they'll have been empowered through that experience of education and in the experience working here, I've been told repeatedly has driven their desire to go back to school and to continue their education. And and in doing so, choosing the kind of education that's impactful on their family, their community, their culture. Mm -hmm. And um, so Lindsay's come back this fall and we're so excited to have her back. And 
the education that she's received, you can see it in the work that she does and the maturity as a young woman now um, to, to initiate this amazing children's hour that she's animated, she's telling traditional stories, they're using Narragansett language, which is a priority for her and her family. Um, and to, well, in our, all our families, but you know what I'm saying? It's really something that she wants to be able to do. And, and so people can learn greetings in the Narragansett language. They can learn topical words of the day based on the story and the theme of the day. Um, every single week they count in, in Narragansett and they do color words in Narragansett, but all based on the theme. And each one has um, an animated traditional story, which is so, so fun, which I think is great for everyone. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's so, it just pulls you in and so engaging. Um, she's just incredibly talented. I'm interested in the, in the IEN um, program. Is that, that's part of the museum's program? Was it, and what, did you start this program? I did. So I don't think I um, truly created it, although I created it on paper. Okay. Because yeah. I feel that people that came before me were already laying the groundwork of advocacy, you know, mm -hmm. of advocating for indigenous people. Way back when we have in our archives, Princess Redwing reaching out to the commissioner of education about inclusion of indigenous content and culture in the curriculum. And this is going back like the 1950s. And I feel like we're still doing that. So part of our indigenous empowerment is the outreach to power brokers in the state to change things. An example of a, a wonderful success in 2016, our organization through our IEN lens advocated for indigenous people in Rhode Island to be able to vote with their tribal IDs. And I actually testified before the, the commission that deals with that and it was approved. And that was a great success. And it was because, so IEN stands for the Indigenous Empowerment Network. It confuses people because it turns out there's lots of definitions of what a network means it's not a network like there's 20 different organizations all working on the same thing as a network. It is us as the hub and then a whole network that we're connecting people to. So for example, our two interns that are here right now, it's part of a project that we did with the National Park Service. It took us about three years to get to this fruition where um, through partnership grant funding, we would have interns that would spend time at Tomaquag Museum and then time at the National Park Service so that they could learn about the careers that are there. Um, and this is something we talked about so long ago with one of our partners. It's always trying to create opportunities. Another example is um, we have a native artist, Dawn Spears, who you know well, that just got selected by the um, New Bedford Art Museum, I believe is the name of the organization. You're listening to Usala Radio. And we're back on Rise and Thrive. Today, our guest is Loren Spears of the Tomaquag Museum. Loren, everything that you're talking about, just uh, bringing people together and, and bridging, doing the bridging and creating opportunities, it's, a, it's um, such a, and it becomes a ripple effect too. So the impact that you have and the work that the Tomaquag Museum does, um, just spread so far and wide. And like you said, there's, there's probably a lot of things that you're not even aware of, you know, how, how powerful that this work that you're doing is. I, I don't, how do you do it? <laughs> so, you know, I, I understand, you know, it's moved from a volunteer organization and you, you, when you came on as executive director, you, you were very focused on creating an infrastructure and putting things down on paper and um, which is, so fantastic and really um, just thinking about the big picture and down the road and and beyond yourself there right and so I think that's that's really a brilliant that's so brilliant um, well my mother doesn't like it but I always say really Lord no she doesn't oh. like what I say oh, okay <laughs> Way back when in like 2010 I said to the board what happens when I get run over by a bus <laughs> And that's why she doesn't like when I say that. Okay. But the reality that, right. that phrasing was you have to prepare. Yes. Like, so we went through the floods of 2010 and it was horrific. And now mm -hmm. we're 10 years later 
in this unprecedented pandemic. Right. And thanks to our donors, our funders, our staff that just like, yeah. and board that just like was like, okay, we're just going to dig deep and we're right. just going to keep doing, you know, um, I think that we had that tenacity this time from the lessons learned mm. last time. One of the things that we learned last time is we did not have a strong enough foundation. So we mm. have been steadily building that. The board has been strengthening the board structures and the work that they do on behalf of the organization. You know, the, the staff has been building the structure. I mean, in 2010, I was the staff. Now, well, yeah, and you know, to be, right, and to be fair, like, if you are the staff and you have a group of volunteers, there's only so much you can do and you're really just going, going, going. Like every, every, you're, you're just surviving. You don't right. have the, the ability to really sit down and take a look at everything. So, Well, I think you know, a couple of things that happened that really helped us is we had the opportunity through the Rhode Island Foundation to be part of their expansion arts program, which is a three-year training program that I participated in and two board members. This is back in like 07. And I think we learned a lot in that process and we implemented some of it, but we've been steadily implementing what we learned over that 10 years, over the next 10 years. Um, because you can't just snap your fingers and have everything in place. Yeah. And as much as you'd like to, but every day we strive toward that next level. Um, you know, you don't want to lose who you are in the strengthening, but you want to ensure, like my goal is to ensure that this is here for my great, great grandchildren, Right. you know, that it's a place they could become an intern at someday because right. it's a structure for yes. consistent internships and opportunities for job development. And that's our IEN program. And uh, to, to have the opportunity to be like we were as kids and come here to the many Thanksgivings and uh, cultural events that we have that are open to the public, but they're really about us as yes. well as indigenous people and about our community and our culture and continuing that forward and being part of it. When I see the young people that come and they're, they're like, oh, I'll do the storytelling you know, for you for, for Cranberry Thanksgiving, and they're willing and happy to do that, or I'll do a dance demonstration, or I'll lead a fashion show. You know, sometimes there are interns, but once they've been our intern, they come back again and just volunteer too. So like just to be part of this community, this network, which is so important. The other thing that I think really um, has been absolutely amazing is I talked funders into giving us funding for staff when everyone has told us they don't fund staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, we had literally, it was myself and a marketing person part-time when I talked them into the assistant director position. And it was back to that when I get run over by a bus concept. If there's nobody there to help mm -hmm. with any of these things, we can't do it. And Silver Moon LaRose has been just like, the perfect person for this. She is so great mm -hmm. in so many ways, but yes. in wrangling um, the structures. When she came on in, in 2016, our structures were floating around in my head. They mm -hmm. were not on any paper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I might have had it scribbled somewhere. I'm the queen of scribbling on paper. And, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but I'm not really a typist. So, like, yeah. to type down is like a whole. I have all thing. these papers. Yeah. Yeah, so she wrangled so many systems into place. And then each person that we've brought on, they wrangle more, you know, when the, you know, collections manager came on, then they're wrangling the policies for collections care. And we have a committee from the board that oversees that, that, you know, reviews. Then our archivist came on and so wrangled exciting. all those things. And then, yeah. you know, having additional educators like Lindsay's on and what is she doing? She's, she's organizing the, the lesson planning so that as we're doing each presentation that that starts getting documented. I'm good at doing what I do, but I often don't document it so that someone else can follow behind. But that's what I've been telling the staff that as we continue to grow, we need to get things on paper so that when new staff comes in, there's something to follow. Mm -hmm. There's trainings that can happen, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things where when we were really small, the first time Lindsay was here, she trained because she stood beside me. Every education program I did, she was with me. Well, as we grow, that becomes impossible. 
right. to do it that way. And so mm-hmm. we have to come up with new strategies to, to build in those strengths. There'll probably be opportunities for them to view things, but not at the same level that she did it the first time around. Um, so, you know, that's part of the growth, you know, and it's, it's interesting because we're doing new facility development. We are still a couple of years out before we'll get somewhere, but it's um, something that we're looking at because we're really tiny here. It has a really personal feeling. People come in, they get a, like basically a tour, even when, when, when it's just a drop by day, when it's not COVID, um, you know, we often gave them a good highlights tour, even if we said we weren't going to, uh, <laughs> we tended to, but there was always somebody there to ask a question and get an indigenous perspective on something. And our interns would come in and tell us, I mean, our interns, I think of like our current high school intern, who's a senior, Nikeki, he's just phenomenal mm-hmm. at giving a tour. Um, so people get a whole history lesson in these tours. And we're like, when we get a little bigger, we want to make sure we still have that. And that's why the internship program is critical. We want to do the other end and have an elder, for lack of a better word, docent program, because elders have so much knowledge, but they don't have the energy that the young people have, but they could be, you know, demonstrating finger weaving and talking to people or, or just sitting by a particular exhibit where they might share their thoughts and things like that, which is so I think that's what makes us vibrant is that first person experience. Yes. Um, and when we get a little bigger, we want to make sure that that's there. We want to make sure that our artists can impact our, our new plans and have outdoor exhibit spaces. And, you know, we have gardens here and we have outdoor um, spaces that we use. And as we grow, we want to continue to have those kinds of connections to the land. And how are you handling this um the quarantine now with, um, because you did have so much, so many events and programs on the land and that's so much a part of um, the experience of coming to Tomaquag. So how are you handling that now? So it was tricky at first. Um, We did flip right away to virtual programming. Um, And so we've been doing that right since March. Um, And that has certainly increased over time as other people got their feet under them and what they were trying to do. So we've been doing lots of virtual programming. Um, Some that we're doing ourselves, like the Children's Hour, the the uh, the Sci-Fi Book Club, Mm -hmm. our Quarantine Creative Series, which is phenomenal. We have another coming up at the end of this month with Catherine Myrtle, who's a a young Indigenous woman um, that's going to be sharing her artwork. Um, They have been phenomenal. People can catch the archived on our YouTube page. Um, But we've been really mixing in like their experience during this pandemic and just social justice issues. I mean, people have been, you know, painting about murdered and missing indigenous women, you know, the the campaign around that about, you know, voting and voting rights and about, um, you know, homelessness and, and, you know, historical trauma and just our culture and how it, it comes through in the art that they do. And so there's been some great um, interviews around those, um, some, just some great stories and beautiful, stunning artwork. Um, and so those are the first things that we did. Um, we actually did our Strawberry Thanksgiving event virtual. We did, um, mm. a, we partnered with um, tribal members and did virtual August meeting powwow with our tribal right. community. Um, we did a virtual cranberry Thanksgiving week um, where we showed, you know, a Johnny Cake demonstrations and, you know, pictures from the archive, video from the archive and things like that. So that's been a little hard not to have those kinds of events. But in August, we did a slow open for private tours. And so that has been really fantastic. We've been doing quite a lot weekly of private tours where families can come they have to call or email and reserve a space um we're doing it six days a week and you know doing all the preventative things so there has to be the time to do the sanitizing before there's the tour and experience um we've taken away all our touch and feel which we miss dearly but we Mm -hmm. did leave for for children our scavenger hunt we went out and purchased plastic clipboards because we had those wooden ones that don't Mm -hmm. work wash really well right and so we still have our clipboards for scavenger hunts that's one thing that they can do that they can kind of engage a little bit um and then we did i thought was a brilliant idea we've gotten in a grant a new bose 
uh, speaker and microphone system because our old one was from 1975, I think. <laughs> so it finally died. And uh, we needed it for speakers. Sometimes speakers speak really soft, right. unlike my big voice. Um, and so we are actually using that. So as people are touring the gallery, we're in one spot and we can okay. maybe four to six feet away from the speaker and talk to them. But we can kind of guide them through the museum. That is fantastic. Walking with them. Yes. And, and that really works. Such you know, great problem solving. Yeah, it works really well. And we have a brand new exhibit that's called Warrior Women that's speaking to the 19th Amendment and, and just indigenous women's impact. Um, it has all of our past honorees before this year um, on the wall, as well as national figures that either intersected with Tamaquag or 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 were just really meaningful to us in our experience. Everything from uh, Gladys Tantaquidgen, who is the founder, Mohegan founder of the Tantaquidgen Museum, which is the mm. oldest native museum in the nation, uh, to people like, uh, uh, Harjo, that's the poet laureate of the United States, and um, you know uh, Winona Laduke, who couldn't mm -hmm. put up a thing and talk about warrior women and not have right. her in there. And of course, there's many, many on the the two women that had gotten into Congress in the last election, mm -hmm. things like that. That's great. Um, you know, just and and the thing is, it's surprising to me how many people come to the museum that don't know these women, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm like almost stunned. You know, I'm like, because yeah. they're so much a part of our experience and our worldview, part right? Our, yes, yes. And I'm like, you can't think about environmental justice and activism and not yeah. think of Winona Ladu. Right. So, so, you know, it's a great opportunity to introduce these people to some of the people that aren't aware of them. And, and some of the, the people that are, that we're talking to that are very involved in environmental issues locally that are not aware of her so that, that we can give them, you know, the, the websites for her and encourage them That's to so her wonderful books and, and all of those kinds of things. That's excellent. So people can come, uh, they have to call to make an appointment or and how, how far in advance are you booking out now? Um, so, you know. November's pretty full. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we are booking out, you know, we can always, it depends. Each day has some wiggle here and there, and there's more than one educator. So depending on the schedule for each one, we can sometimes fit people in, but okay. it is trickier um, on the busier days because we have to have the break in between to do the full cleaning before the next right. Right. Um, Unlike a normal year, you clean for the day and you're done, you know, and now it's, You've got to clean in between each, every person to make sure that everybody's safe. People do have to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Our staff wears masks and we have the by the shields um, to add that extra layer of protection both ways. Mm -hmm. um, but for our staff that are seeing, you know, multiple new groups, we're really trying to ensure their safety. Um, and especially since, you know, we know that COVID-19 is hitting Native communities and other underserved communities and diverse communities very, diff very hard. And we want to ensure that our staff is safe and those yeah. frontline people are Indigenous, you know, so right. we want to ensure that they're safe. Right. Okay. So if you want to make an appointment, you can email. All of the information is on TomaquagMuseum.org. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with Loren Spears. plan today. Because of you, I feel not alone in this world. And you let me know that I'm one person to make you feel wanted.
And we're back on Rise and Thrive. Uh, Lorenz Spears is here and has been filling us in on all the incredible work that's going on. And I want to jump back to the honoring because you have an incredible auction associated with the honoring this year and it's online this time. Yes, a very so, first for us to do And there are some great, great pieces on there and even oh. vacations. So can you share yeah. and talk about how yeah. people can get involved? Certainly. So we are so excited to do this very first inaugural online uh, auction. We have some really great, like amazing indigenous really? art, everything from paintings to pottery to beadwork, you name it, um, gorgeous things. And um, we also have a, a, you can have a trip, a vacation home on Block <laughs> Island. That looks it's amazing. Bathroom. It's three bedrooms, two baths, uh, a three-story home, I think, of your own with balconies and decks off that can see the water, a pathway right to the ocean. Um, it's it's for the off-season. Anytime, I think it was, I want to say October 15th to May 15th, something like that. And so phenomenal opportunity. And another really cool one is the South County Tourism Pack, which people have not caught on to how cool this is. It is a helicopter ride along the coast oh. of the ocean in Rhode Island. Wow. Dinner for two at the Bridge Restaurant in Westerly, Rhode Island, and two nights at the Shelter Harbor Inn, which is oh, this gorgeous fantastic. historic inn in the Charlestown Westerly line. Absolutely a phenomenal, great date weekend. <laughs> you know, anniversary, yes, something yes. fun. For, How beautiful. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. There's, um, you know, book packs and mm -hmm. Tomaquag swag and book packs. We have several books that we've participated in um, that are in it. I believe um, the key into the language of America might be mm -hmm. in it. We put a couple of them in, um, in books that we've participated in in the kit as well as t-shirts and postcards, vintage postcards and all oh, kinds cool. of great things. There's really a lot of um, wonderful um, auction items. And we're thankful to all the people that donated those auction items to us to um, ensure our success. Yes. And, um, and to all the people that are donating, you know, people are so generous, yeah. I have to say. You know, we this year, our honoring is free. Um, normally it's like, you know, a dinner. And so there's cost to that and cost to the thing. That's how we made our money, but we just couldn't, we just couldn't understand how to do it with a ticket mm -hmm. price virtually. So we decided it would be free to everybody, but you can, when you, when you click to be an attendee, which technically you don't have to do, but if you click to be an attendee, um, to kind of register, you can register for free, but then you can also register for donation price points and people are so generous and have been doing That's so wonderful That's such a blessing and then of course our sponsors our sponsors have been phenomenal so many of them that sponsored in the past even with it being virtual we're still supportive and willing to to sponsor us and and then our our funders too you know through this COVID-19 there have been specialty COVID-19 funds resiliency funds mm -hmm from New England Foundation for the Arts and Rhode Island Council on the Humanities and the Rhode Island Council on the Arts and United Way. It, those are funders that we've had and we're just so blessed and lucky yeah. to have those supporters um, that really have helped us to be resilient and to weather this really turbulent time for everyone. And, you know, we know we're not out of the woods yet and we mm -hmm. hope blessings and, and good uh, sustainability for every organization and every um, person out there that they're healthy and that their families are healthy and can make it through this time um, till we get to that vaccine. But it's it's coming, and we just have to we just have to make it through this uh, probably a bit of a long winter. But um, right. I know that we'll get there. And you know our our ideas around Thanksgiving is to remember our blessing. That's why Indigenous people have 13 Thanksgivings and why our organization celebrates those Thanksgivings. And our Nakomo, I'm sure, will be virtual this year. But the, that's that idea of just being thankful and for all your blessings. And, and I think that, that as an organization, that helps us stay grounded and, and to be thankful for all our staff and all the hard work they do, the interns who jump right in and and learn so much, but also give so much of their energy and enthusiasm. It's just it's just remarkable. I mean, Haley, our newest um, IEN intern, she 
um, came on board and she whipped together that auction. Like we were at our capacity organization. We were that's incredible. Just through. I mean, it's hard to do all this editing and these videos. Yes, it's just, that is. It's a ton of work. And we don't, you know, we're a small organization. We couldn't right. afford to get like a production crew to come in. So our team, Quana LaRose, who's our mm-hmm. marketing associate, he's, he's our production team along with Silver Moon and, mm-hmm. you know, the other staff and Tony from giving us images from the archives and, and all of those kinds of things. It, it really has been a lot of um, teamwork to make this happen. And so we're so blessed um, for our staff. And, um, you know, our, our other IEN intern, Laurel, she flipped our in-store gift shop to online. We had attempted it a year and a half ago and wasn't successful at doing it. And she has flipped it and it's been very successful since July being online. And it's been really a blessing to have these young people that have tech skills and, yes. um, and energy and enthusiasm and great artistic eyes in taking the photography for these things. Cause you know, you can put it up there, but if it doesn't look good, it mm-hmm. doesn't it's help. really right. Because it's <laughs> online. It's, you really have to have that strong visual. You can understand that as a photographer yourself. And I'm not a photographer. I'm like for every hundred pictures I take one is worthy of even sort of being called good. <laughs> <laughs> But really, the online store looks fantastic. It's really easy to navigate. There's so many great pieces on there and really nice price points, too. That's the other thing that I noticed about it is that it's accessible. So if, you know, you don't have a huge budget, there are some really beautiful um, gifts that you can get on a budget. And then there are very there are higher end things that you can purchase. And our artists, that's one of the trainings that we did for our artists a while back is the idea of having multiple price points because you have your original painting that might go for a lot, but if you can have prints or Mm -hmm. cards, you know, it gives people an entry point to your art and to your artwork. Um, But also people can come here and have an authentic experience. They're buying something that's made from a native artist uh, or it's, uh, you know, a print or a card from a native original piece. And you know, people love to have that opportunity or to be able to buy a game like Ring and Pin that's been made by a Native artist. I mean, he has artwork that's in the really high end, but he makes these, what I, like you said, entry uh, points that, you know, you can buy a game for $15 or, or a zipper pull for 10 or something mm-hmm. like that. That gives someone some, but yet it's this really um, well done. Exactly. It's special and unique. Your antler hatchet or something to that effect. Right. You know? It's, right you know, with shell or or feather earrings or, or right like that yeah that's in, in, it's incredible to be able to uh to have that and to have that access without having to be in rhode island and, and come to the museum physically so we have about five we minutes have, what we have visitors from all of the last oh May, i know all the way yeah. to california I know you have visitors from all over the world. <laughs> well, I, I meant for the online store. So oh, for the online store. Business. Oh, really? Yeah. That's great. You know, yeah. So I think like you're saying, there is this silver lining because we're learning to, to this whole situation that we've been through this year is that we're learning how to navigate these new ways. And then we can incorporate them when we hopefully go back to a little bit of normalcy and, and yeah. personal connection. But we have a few minutes left and I know you wanted to talk about the blog and a couple of other things. So if you can quickly touch on those. Yes, our, on our website, we have something that's called the Belongings Blog. If you go along the top, there's a button there to just push Belongings Blog. So it's our blog. And we put lots of, what's really cool this year is we've been adding from the archives. So uh, Tony Belts, who's our archivist, he's been taking things from our archive. For example, there's an audio of Princess Red Wing that someone recorded, donated to the museum. It was on a cassette. Oh he played God, it. It turned goodness. out to be from a TV show. And so you can read the blog, click it, go oh. to YouTube, see pictures and hear the voice of Princess Red Wing, which is so cool. Incredible. Um, yeah. So there's things, you know, talking about voting and um, the census and why we weren't really included in that and the history around that. You can um, use our um, 
guide to land acknowledgements because there's a lot of people trying to figure out what that's all about and how they should mm -hmm. do it. So we've created a guide. To oh, that's them. excellent. That's so necessary. So there's all these things in our belongings blog that help people understand indigenous culture. It's good for students. It's good for faculty. It's good for the average American that just wants to know more, as is the road tour. It's... um. I put that in the link as well, but it's roadtour.org, road like Rhode Island, R H O. Okay. Um, and we're number 35. Um, we're show number 35. And it's it's um, this really cool website that tells about Rhode Island history, but it's the first people's road tour, is the one that we did. Oh, wow. That speaks to um, Canonicus and my Antinomy and Ninigret and Quiapin from that 1600s time period, goes into the 1700s with the Indian church and, and then goes forward all the way to the 21st century with the, the food sovereignty initiative. So you can learn more about my grandparents, Eleanor and Ferris Dove. You can learn about Ellis and Tarzan Brown, who was a Narragansett mm -hmm. Olympian and two time uh, winner of the Boston Marathon. You know, So all these really interesting people. I mean, there was a million other things we could do, but we our goal was 10. <laughs> 10 That's phenomenal. Our tour. And so that's a really great resource and opportunity for people to see. And so Excellent. those are the kinds of partnerships that we create to create more visibility for indigenous people, more access to resources for mm -hmm. teachers, educators, and families. And if you can't come to Rhode Island, you can tour it virtually. Right, exactly. Thank you for sharing all of those things. I'll put these uh, links on our social media. And whoa, it's been a lot. <laughs> so um um, we're, we'll wrap up. I'm really excited. Tomaquagmuseum.org. If you want to get on there, there's all the links are there. Um, check out the last honoring tonight is the last honoring with Matika yeah. Wilbur. Live and at six o'clock. Live at six o'clock. It's wonderful. Um, so definitely tune into that. Check out all the auction items, Christmas shopping on Tomaquagmuseum.org's um shopping page there's so much so please visit and check it out and, and visit in person when we're able loren i so admire you you are such an inspiration thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to speak with us and to share everything that you're doing i really appreciate it thank you so much katabatash yes and right back at you i'm so proud of you and everything that you're doing in this wonderful show which is just a small tidbit of all the work that you do Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next week when uh, we'll have Laylee Long Soldier on next Friday, November 20th, on Rise and Thrive on Usula Media. Have a great weekend. And it's all right with me. It's all right.